All right, welcome, welcome everybody to Dr. Jennifer Brown's uh, talk this morning about um, avoiding roadblocks for IRB approval. And Dr. Brown is an Associate Professor of Educational Foundations in the Department of Teacher Education, Leadership and Counseling. Her research interests include undergraduate retention, effective instructional strategies, mathematical anxiety, and homeschooling. Dr. Brown serves as the chair of Columbus State University's Institutional Review Board. So welcome, Dr. Brown, and thank you for doing this this morning. All right. Well, good morning. And since we have a small group today, it'll make it um, a little easier. So feel free to, if you have questions, um, put it in the chat. Uh, Heather will read those and we can make sure any questions are answered. Um, there are three handouts. One is a flow chart. I'm going to kind of go through the flow chart quickly, but it's just to kind of let you know how the IRB works. Um, and then we're going to talk about the different classifications with the IRB, something to think about as you plan a study. And then I also gave you a, a sample IRB. Um, and I have written this sample IRB, so feel free to copy and paste the exact wording. I give you permission to do that. Also on the IRB's website, there are two mock uh, IRBs under frequently asked questions. So please feel free to download those and copy and paste anything you feel like you need for your IRB application from those because I also authored those and I give you permission to do those. We do those to help people to make sure that your wording is correct and that you have all the required components according to um, the regulations. And I gave you a little note-taking guide. It's just a little short note-taking guide, piece of paper to write um, notes on. It's not required, but some people like note-taking guides. If uh, you've ever had me as an instructor, I always give note-taking guides to kind of help people with the note-taking process. All right, so let's get started. Avoiding roadblocks for IRB approval. So that's kind of the primary purpose. Um, we do fall under the academic affairs. So if you're looking for the IRB's website, it is under academic affairs. You can also search for it on the CSU website and you will find us. Um, and our email address is pretty easy, irb at columbusstate.edu. So we're gonna talk about the purpose of the IRB. We're gonna outline the IRB submission and review processes using a flow chart, and that's the flow chart I've given you. And we're also uh, going to identify some helpful hints for uh, submitting an IRB. So over, I've been the IRB chair since 2013, I think. Uh, time goes by fast. Uh, so over the years, we have come up with basically a top 10 of things that are roadblocks um, that delay students getting, or even faculty getting their IRB. I give the same, the same presentation to faculty um, to getting their IRB applications approved. All right, so the CSU IRB has oversight based on federally mandated guidelines over research projects that will be disseminated through presentations and or publications and include human subjects. So if you are not using human subjects, um, for, your I, for your study, the IRB does not need to be involved. Um, if you are using human subjects and your presentation will be presented somewhere, such as a dissertation, you are presented in public and your dissertation is also published. Thesis are also presented in public and published on the CSU ePress. So anything such as that, or if you're going to a conference where you're going to be presenting the findings to uh, a room full of people or even virtual conferences now, um, all of that needs to go through the IRB. What is the purpose of the IRB? So we provide an objective overview. Um, so this is a very good example of this as I'm involved with the doctoral program. So if one of my students is involved with a research study and we submit that IRB, I have to recuse myself from that because we want an objective review of someone that's not involved with the study. They look at it with fresh eyes and review the application. Basically, we review and evaluate the risk and benefits. We want to know what are the risks of the study, what are the benefits of the study, 
And is there a balance uh, as to whether someone, uh, the IRB looks at that to decide whether participants should be able to participate in such study? We ensure that participants are selected equitably. Um, you have to make sure that everyone has an equal chance of being selected for the study. And we review permission to participate procedures if applicable. So um, a lot of that goes with coercion. We wanna make sure that partic participants and if you're doing children, their parents have had the option to participate in the study and they were not coerced or pressured to be part of that study. So here's the flow chart. I uploaded that um, in the chat so you can see how it goes. And we're gonna hit, go through some of the high points here. It's kind of complicated, but as you can see, it all depends on decisions that are made. So first of all, a researcher would compete, complete the human subjects training, and that is the city training. And that link for that are provost office, office of sponsored programs, and the College of Education and Health Professions all contribute money to pay for that training. So you get to do it as a faculty member or a student. Um, they all can participate in that training. It is required. You have to submit that certificate when you submit your IRB application. So that is very important, first thing to do. It, it does take a little while to go through it. I think there's a 10 or 11 modules, but um, it's well worth it. And probably most of you have completed it or will complete it when you're doing some of your research courses. Um, in your program of study, they require that human subjects training. So a lot of you will already have that when you're ready to do your IRB. So you complete the IRB application. Again, there's mock applications um, online to help you with the wording. Um, and it's just a fill in the blank. You answer the questions and you go through um, and basically make sure everything's filled out. And then you have to submit that application along with any supporting materials to the IRB. And we refer to that as an addendum. And what are those things? So if you are doing a survey, the IRB needs to see a copy of the survey. If you're doing an interview, we need to see the interview questions. If you are sending out recruitment flyers, letters, or emails, even post on social media, we need to see what that looks like. If you are working with a school system or some kind of business or entity, we need a letter of cooperation. Um, some students give an email that gives them, uh, that says they have permission or that the agency will work with them with recruitment or giving them data, depending on what your study is. Um, the letters of cooperation are not required for the initial um, review. So you can get what we call conditional approval if you do not have your letter of cooperation or your letter of support. I know some school systems, for example, they want to see that the institution has approved the IRB application before they will approve it. So um, it's okay. You just mark on there that it's pending. And then when you get IRB approval, it'll be conditional and it's conditional upon you getting permission from that outside agency. Um, informed consent. So all of, if you're not waiving the informed consent, if you are interviewing or surveying someone, you need to have an informed consent for them to complete and your certificate from your human subjects training. So when you submit that, it, is go it goes through what we call an initial screening process. And the checklist for the initial screening process is available on the website for the IRB. And it's pretty self-explanatory. It's basically, did you complete everything on the application and did you include everything in your addendum? So if it didn't pass, it comes back to you for revisions. And to be honest, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later. This is the primary snag of why people do not get IRB pro approval in a timely manner. They turn in applications that are incomplete, something's missing. They have one thing on one page and on the next page, it says something else. Um, so it's very important to make sure that that application is filled out correctly. I know when my uh, 
doctoral students are going through the process. I have them complete the IRB and then I look at it with fresh eyes and make sure that everything is completed and filled out. Um, also what I do sometimes when you're filling out the application, it underlines your responses. So I like to keep the underlining. So again, that helps me see that every question is answered when I see the text that's underlined. If it passes, it comes to me and then I classify it. There's three classifications according to Health and Human Services, which we fall under um, as an IRB. So it comes to me and I make that decision based on what the registration, what the uh, legislation, I guess it's regulation, it's not really legislation, the regulations say. So there's three categories, exempt, expedited, and full board review. Uh, the regulations were revised in 2018, and now most of our studies fall under the exempt category. And that means there is no more than minimal risk, no greater than those discomforts encountered on da in during daily life. So taking a survey, as long as the topic is not controversial, um, interviews, as long as it's, again, not making someone extremely uncomfortable with things you're asking, those uh, types of surveys and interviews would all fall under exempt. So this would include um, anonymous surveys on um, inoffensive topics, secondary analysis. So if you're pulling data from the school system and you're running another analysis, pre, what we call pre-existing data, um, that would be exempt. Survey and interview data without direct links to the participants. Um, and this last, this well, next to last one, benign behavioral interventions. So this is still a little fuzzy um, as how they define it at the HHS, but basically it's a brief study in duration. So if you're coming in, you're asking the participants to do a really short study and complete a follow-up survey within an hour's time, that would be a brief, harmless, painless intervention. And then curriculum-based research conducted in established or commonly accepted educational settings. So uh, basically this is research that occurs in the classroom, whether that's P-12 or post-secondary institutions. Most of that research is considered exempt because it's something you would do on a normal basis, an everyday basis in your classroom. All right, so if you're exempt, I review the application. If it's approved, ding, 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 you get an approval letter. If it is not approved, it is returned to you for revisions. The next classification is expedited. So this is greater than minimum risk and some research with students younger than 18. So anytime you're wanting to do research with minors, that's a red flag. Um, some research with minors would be considered exempt, but most of it does fall under expedited just because children um, are considered a vulnerable population. Ongoing behavioral interventions, uh, we see this with exercise science. Uh, they are asking participants to come to the lab across multiple weeks, and that would be considered an expedited study. So that's a, it's a Another layer of approval, another layer of risk. So we have to, not only do I review it, but it also goes out to two reviewers on the IRB. One would be inside the college and one would be the outside the college. So if you're in psychology, you would be, uh, one reviewer would be in that college, not necessarily that department, but in that college that psychology falls under. And then the other one could be in business, it could be in arts, it could be in education and health professions. Um, they send the feedback to me and then I review the feedback and based on their feedback, I approve it and you get an approval letter or if there need, needs to be revisions, it is returned for revisions. The last classification is full board review. We really do not see a lot of this at CSU just because of the nature of the studies that are conducted at CSU. So research that might put participants at risk for criminal or civil liability, uh, research on sensitive topics, 
Research involving psychological or physiological intervention that require more than minimal risk and research with vulnerable populations. So um, a, a good example is this a few years ago, criminal justice wanted to work with, a, wanted to conduct a study with prison population um, at the local jail. So that's a vulnerable population. Um, individuals with lower cognitive ability or even some participants with limited English proficiency may be considered vulnerable populations depending on your study. We've had some IRBs that have targeted that population. So they have changed all the uh, paperwork and surveys. They have transcribed them or translated them into uh, the predominant language, the home language, native language, so that um, that would not be a risk of them not understanding the items on the survey or not understanding what they're agreeing to on the informed consent. All right, so full board review is a very long process. It has to be reviewed by the entire IRB at a meeting, which we only meet once a month. After the meeting, and you, you as a researcher would present the study, then we, as the IRB would ask you questions, and then we would discuss it. Um, the IRB would discuss the feedback. And then if we approve it, you get an approval letter. And if revisions are needed, we send you those to you and you revise the IRB application. All right, so you ready? We don't have clicker cards, but we're gonna do it in the chat. So I'm gonna bring up my chat because there's just a few of y'all. So you're gonna tell me whether it's an A, an exempt study, B, expedited study, or C, a full board review, okay? All right. So interviews with high school athletes about how they benefit from playing sports. So what do you think? What type of study would that be? Would it be exempt, expedited, or full board review? All right. I see that we said B, and you are correct. And it is B because you're working with high school students. So that's a, a red flag there. All right, an anonymous online survey about college students' knowledge of on-campus recycling efforts. Oh, boy, yeah, we're quick Johnny to the spot with that one. Yes, that would be A. Um, it's anonymous and it's a very, it's a simple topic, right? Interviews with college students to discuss their personal drug use. Oh, I see it possible C, and you are correct. Um, it is C because interviews, you definitely know who you're talking to when you're interviewing someone. So you kind of lose that anonymity. I can't even say the word. They're not anonymous anymore. Um, and then you're asking about drug use, which is illegal. So you're asking them, you know, if they're admitting to they criminal behavior. So that is definitely a full board review. All right, I'm going to zoom through these last few here. All right. Any questions before we move on to the top 10 helpful hints? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Top 10. Let's see. Do not assume that the IRB will understand. Explain with enough detail how and why. So we do not want to be vague when you're completing your IRB application. You want to be very specific. And actually, I have my students, this is from the doctoral world, when we write chapter three, of course, that's very detailed. We write chapter three, get all the kinks worked out, and then we complete the IRB. And we still go back after doing the IRB and add detail to chapter three because we want so much detail on the IRB. There's no question about what's gonna happen first, what's gonna happen second, where are you gonna get the email addresses, where, how are you gonna contact people, where are you gonna conduct the interviews, you want all of that information um, in there. Spell out all anacronyms, because again, you don't know who will be reviewing it, 
Um, you may be in education. We use a lot of an acronyms in education. Someone reviewing it may be in psychology or they may be in the College of the Arts. So they are not aware with, of all of our alphabet soup in education. So you need to spell it all out. It may get long and tedious, but it's best to spell everything out. And even for your participants, right? They may not understand if you're sending a informed consent to your parents, they may not be familiar with the anacronyms that we use uh, in our profession. Sync your application with the informed consent. So this is how I have my students do. We complete the application. We make sure it's perfect. It's exactly how we want it. And then we literally copy and paste the different sections from the application into the template for the informed consent. That way there's no question about anything being different in the informed consent compared to the application because that is a red flag and believe it or not, it happens very often. Someone will say something, the informed consent will say, they'll say, we're gonna conduct a focus group. And then we look back at the application and it said nothing about conducting a focus group. And what likely happened was when they were developing their study, they were gonna do a focus group and they changed their mind. And they just didn't go back and take it out of the informed consent. And so it's always best practice to do the application first and then copy and paste from that application into the informed consent template. Then that way you are good to go as far as the two items being synced. Check spelling and grammar. Um, this is a, believe it or not, we, even though we have spell check and everything else, a lot of issues with spelling and grammar. And if it's really bad, it's really hard to understand what's going on in the application if the spelling and grammar are uh, a little rocky. So check that. It's always a good idea to have somebody else read it. Give yourself enough time to submit, revise if necessary, and obtain IRB approval. Um, do not turn your application in on a Friday afternoon and expect to get approval by Monday morning. It will not happen. It will not happen. Just to give you a little perspective, on average, it takes 12 days. So that's, that's 12 working, well, that's 12 calendar days. So that's two working weeks of, from the time the IRB gets the application in our inbox till I approve it and send you, and say, okay, it can be approved. So it's 12 days, just for a simple exempt study. Um, and the biggest issue with why that takes so long is it takes so long for people to get through the initial screening process, like we talked about earlier, making sure everything's in that addendum, making sure everything's filled out. Um, it takes many, many days to, for people. And actually after your second attempt, you have to wait 30 days. Um, so it's best to get it right the first time. And then sometimes, even I, as the chair, make mistakes. And sometimes I even get my application sent back to me saying, you're missing this. So um, we all make mistakes, but you only get a second try. And if you fail the second time, then you're going to have to wait 30 days before you can resubmit. So we need to make sure that we're doing it correctly the first time. If you have an expedited study, it's on average 24 days before you get approval. And that's because it has to be sent out to the committee members to review. And it takes time for people to review things. People are busy. Um, so it takes time for them to feedback to me and then for me to review it and get the feedback um, back to the IRB coordinator. So be mindful of these timelines um, when you're wanting to do your study. So you need to kind of think backwards. This is when I want to conduct my study. And then you need to work backwards so that you can make sure that everything is done in a timely manner. It's always good to have time at the end and not because you can't rush the IRB. It's just it's the, the, the wheels have to, the gears have to turn in a certain process. All right, understand the difference between anonymous and confidential data. So when you're talking about confidential data, that 
pertains to the treatment of the information. So if they give you their email, if they give you their gender and their, their zip code, all of that is how you as the researcher are keeping that information confidential. Are you using a password protected computer? Are you storing it in a locked cabinet? Um, so that would be confidential. Anonymous pertains to an, any identifying information collected from the participants. So a truly anonymous study, they're doing it on an uh, online survey. You do not know who they are. They're clicking a link. They're giving you limited uh, demographics, maybe gender and racial classification, um, provided it's not a very small sample for you to be able to identify who is completing it. So that's basically the goal of anonymous data. You have no idea as the researcher, when you look at the data, are you able to pinpoint who this person was that completed this survey? All right, manage any conflicts of interest. So you want to make sure that you are not a person of authority. Um, that's, so if I'm a classroom teacher, you have to be aware of coercion. So if I'm a classroom teacher asking my students to complete a survey, um, if it's outside of normal operating procedures, that could be considered coercion because you are the instructor of record and they want you, as their students, they're wanting to make you happy by agreeing to be in the study. Also, you have to worry about it if you are of a supervisory or evaluative uh, personnel. So if you supervise personnel or if you evaluate them, um, it could be considered coercion if you're asking those subordinates to complete your survey or participate in your study. So a way to do that is to select an outside person to recruit the participants and collect identifying data. So the IRB example that I uh, gave you in the chat box, that, it, that was a study that I conducted several years ago with a fellow colleague um, and we used a graduate assistant because we were collecting data from our students in the classroom. And we did not know who was participating in the study until our grades were submitted in December. And once the grades were submitted, and I, we still didn't know who, can, who was in the, in the study because the graduate assistant kept the informed consents and she also uh, removed the names from all the assignments that we collected from the, throughout the semester. Um, so she kept track of that and made sure that we did not know who was participating in the study. Um, if you offer extra credit for research participation, Make sure you provide an alternative um, with the same time commitment. So you would not give someone a survey that takes 10 minutes. And then if they don't want to take the survey, you'll let them do a 10 page research paper for the same amount of extra credit. That's not comparable and equitable. So we need to make sure that what you're doing is the same. And it cannot be a course requirement. You can ask them to participate in the study, but you cannot require it as part of their grade. Make sure all materials are in one addendum. So what you have to do is take all of those things that we talked about at the beginning, merge them together into a PDF. I use a PDF just because it makes it easy. You can also do it in a Word document. Merge it all together so it's in one document because some studies have a lot of supporting materials. And so as the IRB, when we get this packet of information, we have an application and then we have 20 other things to look through. It's very cumbersome. So we ask for the application and then we ask for the addendum. And I can say from a reviewer's point, I look at the application and I read it. And then I open up the addendum and I do them side by side on my screen. And it just makes it an easier process. So all the all materials in one addendum. Write an informed consent using lay person terminology. So you want active voice, short, concise sentences. You do not want to copy and paste from chapter three in your dissertation or under your methods in your thesis. And same thing for the application. We really do not want to read 
your chapter three is part of the IRB application. It needs to be short and concise. You also want to watch the reading level if you're working with adults, sixth to eighth grade. Um, if you're working with children, it obviously needs to be on their grade level. Um, if you're doing uh, informed consent with children, you have to do what we call an assent form, which is not necessarily all the complicated jargon of the informed consent, but you're saying, you know, I'll tell you, I, I did one for a group. I said, I miss Jennifer and I'm doing a study to find out about reading and writing and art. And I would like you to participate in my study. And you kind of give them a brief uh, idea. You know, we're gonna write a children's book at the end of this workshop. Would you like to participate? Okay, um, so real, real short and simple. Of course, the informed consent goes to the parents that see all the jargon and information about the study. But you do have to ask children to participate, even if they're little bitty. You can do smiley faces, you can do a checklist where they agree to you, um, yes or no, you have to, where you record whether they said yes or no, um, but you do have to ask their permission. And it is possible the children will say no and the parents will say yes, and then that just is the way it is. Um, familiarize yourself with the IRB jargon, policies and procedures, and guess what, you're doing that today for joining um, this session so that you can learn about what's expected of the IRB. Um, some people do not do that. And so they're not really aware of all the items they need to do to make sure that their, IR, their IRB sale application goes through the process quickly. All right. So read through the application first, familiarize yourself with each section. And I gave you a sample um, so that you could do that. Respond to all the items and make sure that all items of the template are um, completed. Place the requested information in the appropriate section and utilize short and concise responses. Again, it's not a good idea to copy and paste a paragraph in there. Um, the committee, the board members do not want to look through all of that. Um, so another thing I'll mention here too, if you do have to make revisions, it's a good idea to make those revisions and highlight them. And also when I respond back to the IRB, if revisions were asked, I make a list. I say, okay, in section I, I did this revision. In section G, I made this revision. In the informed consent, I made this revision. And then on those, within those sections, I highlight the revision so that it makes it very easy for the IRB to see that you've made all of the revisions that were requested. Um, again, it just helps get things approved a little quicker. All right, we're going to try a little bit. Heather, how are we doing on time? Yeah, we're at uh, 9.36. Oh, great. All right, we're going to do a little review and see uh, if you can tell me yay, nay. Oh, there we go. So green, yellow, red. So green means yay, the researcher did it good, very well. Yellow is like, mm, that's kind of iffy. And red is like, oh, that's not good. Okay. So a researcher collects pre-existing test scores to examine the effectiveness of a math intervention. The researcher removes the names from the data. In the IRB application, the researcher labels the data coding as anonymous. So what do you think? Is that correct? Yay, or maybe correct, or no, that's not correct. Maybe, correct, all right, let's see. Oh, sorry, back that up. All right, so the question is, why is this not so good, okay? So the researcher is the one who removes the names from the data. So if you want, if this scenario applies to you, you would want an outside person to remove the names from the data because then you have no clue whose data it is because it's not really anonymous because you could, you're the one that's removing the names from the data so that it's not anonymous. Anonymous would be if someone else removed the data, okay? 
When participants arrive at the lab, they will be given two copies of informed consent. Participants will be told to please read the informed consent. And if you would still like to participate, please sign both copies. When I, then I will sign them. You will get a copy and I will keep a copy. If the participant signs the two copies, then he or she will be allowed to complete the inventory. So what do you think? All right, you are correct. All right. The researcher wants to determine the effectiveness of a writing intervention using a quasi-experimental design with a treatment and control group. But he excludes Sally Sue from the writing, the treatment group because she has a learning disability. Very good. <laughs> that would be a no. All right. You cannot exclude someone from a participant group. That's not legitimate. Sally Sue has to have uh, an option to be part of that uh, study as well. Because your study has benefits. So Sally Sue needs to benefit from that study as well. The participants will be assured anonymity when the interview will be videotaped. The videotape will be stored in the researcher's office within a locked filing cabinet until the transcription and data analysis are complete. So what do you think? All right, very good. Y'all are doing great. Yeah. If you're on videotape, you are not anonymous. You are not anonymous. All right, the researcher plans to administer even, I want to backtrack that, even audio. Because some people say, well, it's audio. Well, if someone has a distinct voice, you're not anonymous, okay? Because they can hear that voice and say, hmm, is that Dr. Brown that participated in that study? So. The researcher plans to administer a pretest and post test to determine the effectiveness of a reading intervention. The participants will use their student ID numbers as their identifier to ensure confidentiality. Within the IRB application, the researcher indicates confidential with direct coding. So what do we think? Okay, all right, and th this is a good thing for us to talk about. So direct coding means it's a direct link. It's a direct link. Um, so your name is your direct link. Oh, oh sorry, let me go back. The, uh, I was trying to get the music to stop. So your name is a direct link and in our world at CSU, your student identification number is, it, everybody knows if we go into the banner system and put your ID in, we know exactly who you are and everything about you. So that is a direct link to you. So that is true. You can do that kind of study. Um, I did a lot of it when I first came to CSU because I tracked retention across multiple years of cohorts. So I had to have their name and their student ID number to track their progress at CSU and whether they stayed each semester. Um, but it just takes a level of storage. I had to make sure that my data was stored securely, password protected, locked office. I didn't leave my computer on um, so anyone could access um, that information. So you can do that. Um, some people use indirect coding, um, and that is where you change the, um, so you, instead of saying Sally Sue, you say teacher A, or student B, or participant one, participant two. That's called indirect, meaning the researcher is the only one who knows who student A was and who student B was. Um, so that's the typical way to do it, but some people do keep direct access um, to, to monitor if they want to merge pre-existing data. Like for instance, if you're in the classroom, um, if you want to download students pre-test and post-test from a computer program, that's gonna be associated with their names. All right, Whoop, sorry. So any questions? 
That is all I have. Y'all did great today. I'm so glad you joined me early on a Saturday morning. If you are using a pre-existing data set or materials about deceased human subjects, would it be necessary? Where would you be getting that, Nikki? Where would you be getting that data set from? Oh, okay. You would not, you would ask for a waiver and there's actually under informed consent, there's a number one is how are you gonna get informed consent? And number two is, are you asking for a waiver? So that is what you would say. You would say, I'm waiving it because I'm obtaining it from a state agency. Is the state agency gonna remove the names? Are you just gonna have information, no identifying information? Yeah. More than likely, they're gonna probably, um, they're gonna remove, when they give you that data set, they're gonna take away the names. I doubt you'll have uh, this specific student person's names. I may be wrong, but that's something to think about when you're doing your IRB. Do you really need to know their names? If you don't need to know their names, you can say, when you give me the data set, please remove the names so that I'm not, um, so I do not know who the participants are. I just have their data. So yes, you would ask for a waiver. Um, so that's number two and you would justify it. Anybody else have any questions? Michelle, I'll get, uh, Heather will um, upload the, the handouts and this ha session has been recorded. So you will be able to watch it again online when they post it. Anybody else, any questions? Okay, well, thank you for joining today. Awesome. And I hope you have a great rest of your um, writing retreat so that you learn lots of great things to help you with your study and your writing. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me or the IRB.